Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The King James text today reads, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not! For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I want to read also to you quickly 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. The Apostle Paul wrote, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it they would not have crucified the Lord of glory hallelujah mm, glory to God thank you Jesus for the word of the Lord Thank you, Master, today for this time of year. Lord, just remembering your coming to this planet brings a spirit of peace upon the world. People look at one another more kindly. They see one another more gently. People are more cooperative. People are more kind. They show more manners and decency. Oh God, oh Master, just the thought of the Christ child coming changes the face of our planet. It touches every heart, be that heart, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist. It touches every heart in some kind of way. And even those who do not yet believe this glorious gospel are uplifted and inspired by the, the great old songs of the church that celebrate this sacred event, the Incarnation, the day God allowed himself to be manifest as man. Oh, Master, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time of year. The Word of God is about to go forth. The messenger of the gospel is feeble, 
weak, needy. There's nothing I can say or do for the church of the living God except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I implore, Master, at this hour I implore you not to let the Spirit of God drip, but let the Spirit of God be poured out like a mighty waterfall upon the church at this hour. Right now, Master, in the name of Jesus, even before the Word of God goes forth, let the anointing begin to flow into the homes, into the dorm rooms, into the living rooms, Master, the hotel rooms. Every individual that's watching this message right now, be it recorded or be it live, let the anointing and presence and power of the Holy Ghost right now begin to fill the space they occupy and let it touch their heart and cultivate it. Break up that old stony ground and make it ready to not only hear with their hearing, but to receive with a welcome and joyful heart the truths of God's Word. Lord, that this seed planted today will later emerge as a great and mighty plant bearing fruit unto the glory of Christ our King. We ask all this in another today than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many people today long for a politician who is concerned about them. They want someone in a place of power. They want someone in a place of authority who actually is concerned about their lives and their situations. They do not see and understand that no one is more inclined toward the humblest among us than the very God of creation. Honey, there is nobody in this universe that cares more about you than the most powerful, the most potent, the most capable being that has ever existed. So don't worry about the politician caring. Your creator cares. Your God cares. Hallelujah. Upon the occasion of the Lord's incarnation, it was not kings or priests or nobles whom the Lord would announce his arrival to, but rather shepherds and foreigners. Oh, I want to tell you, my friend, today, many know only part of, of the story of this man Jesus Christ and like the princes and the great men of his time they treat the Lord poorly based upon their limited knowledge of who he is to know who he is in truth is to believe on him and to walk in communion with him from a very different place than do those who know only part of the story. The Apostle Paul declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that if the princes of this world, meaning men of power and influence, he said, if powerful men, men with influence and authority of this world, if they had known who in fact this child born in a manger in the lowly, tiniest, humblest of towns called Bethlehem, if they had known in fact and in truth who this child was, they would not have crucified him, for they would have understood him to be the Lord of glory. 
many. Oh, my Lord, today, listen to me, children. In Matthew 2, 1 through 3, the word of the Lord declares, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. The last thing a man sitting as a king wants to hear is, where is this child who is born king of the Jews? That was the position that Herod was sitting in. Herod the Great ruled as king of the Jews under Roman authority for 30 years from 37 uh, B.C. to 4 B.C. It is this Herod who appears in the account of Jesus' birth. Antipater, which was Herod's father, was made the first procurator of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee by Julius Caesar due to his support of the Roman Empire in 47 BC. Around this time his son Herod was also made the provincial governor of Galilee in 40 BC, just three years after his father's death by poisoning. Herod is given the title of King of Judah or King of the Jews by the Roman Senate. Oh, Herod got word that the King of the Jews had been born and we know the horrors that he visited upon the babies in Judea because of this news. He was a very insecure man. He was not a very kind man, a very wicked man. He did not rightfully occupy the throne as king of the Jews. He was not in within the proper lineage. He was not of the proper house. He was there strictly through uh, political patronage. He was insecure because the people of Judea hated him. <laughs> Nobody liked him. You know what I'm talking about? You ever seen a politician that most people can't stand? But there was one group in the nation who had to work closely with Herod, and that group was the Jewish Sanhedrin the leadership of the Jewish faith. They had their laws and Rome had its laws. And it was imperative that the two of them work together in order to keep peace. Herod wanted always to keep peace. He wanted always for uh, there not to be any rebellion. He didn't want any fighting, any wars. So he worked closely with the religious leadership of his day. And although he was hated and despised by the Jewish people, he was very closely in communication with the Sanhedrin. My, doesn't that sound like our modern era? In Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, the Word of God declares, much later than the Christmas story, now we're getting to the crucifixion. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he, meaning Jesus, answering, said unto them, Thou sayest it. 
and the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. According to historian Daniel, Daniel R. Schwartz, in his book, Anchor Bible Dictionary, Pilate was appointed a prefect. This was a high-ranking role that involved supervising a region's finances and military on behalf of Rome, as well as acting as chief justice and head of the civil service because he was the Roman representative of a Jewish majority area. Pilate shared duties with an elite Jewish council called the Sanhedrin. My, isn't it interesting how closely kept the religious leadership of Israel was with the political appointees and the figureheads who served on behalf of Rome. In the Roman Governors, a publication, a book written by the Jewish historian Josephus, Josephus wrote that Pilate intended to subvert the Jewish customs by introducing into the city of Jerusalem busts of the emperor, you know, busts of Caesar Augustus that stemmed from military standards when the law of the Jews forbade such images. When the people protested, spending five days rioting against the images, Pilate is said to have ordered his soldiers to surround them and threaten them with death if they did not stop protesting. When the Jews said they'd rather die than see their laws broken, he relented and had the images removed. Mm. This guy would do just about anything to avoid riots and to avoid conflict. You wonder why he eventually handed Jesus over to be crucified. Because this man would do anything to avoid conflict. He was a little bit of a scaredy cat at heart. In Romans chapter 1 verses 20 through 25, this is what the apostle Paul writes of the Romans. Remember, remember, Within Paul's lifetime, he witnessed all of these events. He witnessed the Romans putting these busts of Caesar Augustus throughout Jerusalem in an effort to pollute, purposely to pollute, the Jewish belief system. Pilate was purposely trying to dilute. He was trying to see if I can get them to compromise a little on their faith. If I can get them to compromise a little on their religion. I'm going to tell you, honey, there's a lot of trouble when, when the church gets in bed with politicians. This is what Paul wrote concerning the Romans in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. He said, For the invisible things of him, meaning God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God hid. So Paul says, now, he said, everything from the beginning makes sense. Everything from the beginning has come into focus, and we are able to clearly see it. He said, even his eternal power and God hid. He said, so that they are without excuse, referring to the Romans.
because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God <laughs> neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Listen. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome. He's referring to the Roman customs and the Roman behavior and the Roman actions. Listen to what he says now. He said, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Referring again to Pilate, uh, uh, to Julius Caesar, I should say, okay, to the Caesars. He said they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now when we read this passage, you know we're going to be studying this in a couple weeks in our Wednesday night Bible study, Romans 1. Oh, people love to go to Romans 1 and they torture it, folks. They torture Romans 1. Paul's writing specifically to the church at Rome. He's writing about ancient Rome at the time of his writing. But it's interesting that the, Paul uses the word uncleanliness. Uncleanness. He said that... Um, Sure he did. <sighs> All of a sudden I can't find the word. There it is. Verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And immediately people think they know. People think they know what this means. People think they know how this is applied. Oh, immediately our minds go to sex. Because after all, God has nothing better to do and nothing better to talk about at any moment in, in time than all things sexual. However, the word uncleanness here is from a Greek word that is translated in a moral sense, the impurity of lustful, listen, lustful, luxurious, profligate living. Profligate means recklessly extravagant or wasteful in the use of resources. In other words, this abuse of themselves that they engaged in was drunkenness and orgies and behaving in all kinds of immoral and ungodly manner, okay? It is, this was not merely a, a term that was employed on cleanness, having anything in the world to do with sexual things in and of itself. No, they were given to excess. They were giving. It was known that ancient Rome was famous for their orgies and their religious ritual sex. It was known that they were famous for their drunkenness and what we would call today their partying. <sighs> In the end, the Apostle Paul states to us that had the princess or the powerful men of the Lord's day known who he was in truth, they would not have crucified him. 
Thus it was incumbent upon the Lord during his earthly journey that his divinity remain a mystery. It had to remain somewhat shrouded until after his resurrection. His death was part of the plan. It was the purpose, the reason for his coming. And therefore, he could not afford anything that might cause that part of the plan not to take place. And a general revelation of his divinity, if the kings, if the queens, if the princes, if the powerful had known who he was, Paul said, they would not have crucified who? The Lord of glory. Oh my goodness, the Romans sure missed it. Unfortunately, it was the Romans who were in a position to change the outcome. Had the Romans known who Jesus was, had Pilate known who Jesus was as he stood before him in the judgment hall, had Herod known who Jesus was when the wise men came and said, where is this one who is born king of the Jews? They might have acted very differently for fear of the retribution of the Almighty. But it was not until just prior to his ascension that the Lord opened the eyes and the understanding of his apostles and his disciples so that they might fully see and understand what they had just lived through. See, they lived it. They lived through Three and a half years of walking with Jesus in public ministry. They had witnessed the miracles. They had witnessed deliverance from demons. They had witnessed the cleansing of the leper. They had witnessed the raising up from the dead of a widow's son. They had witnessed the Lord calling from the grave Lazarus his friend. They had witnessed, oh hallelujah, they had witnessed the waters calming at the command of his voice, mm -hmm. peace, be still. Mm -hmm. And yet still, <laughs> they didn't fully get it. You wonder why there are people in our world today who still don't get it. They were there. They saw these things happen. They didn't read about it in a book. They watched it happen. And the best response they could give was, What manner of man is this? <laughs> in Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through verse 48, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. I'm going to tell you something. If he wasn't nothing but a man, how in the world was he able to open people's understanding? There's a, almost half of America right now that I wish to God I had the power to open their understanding because right now they're a bunch of blubbering idiots who are blind as a bat and who are being led down a very dangerous path and nothing you can say, nothing you can do, nothing you can show them will 
cause them to wake up from their slumber and see what is really happening. And yet, just before its ascension, the word of God said, Then opened he their understanding. Who else but God? Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul writes, How that by revelation he, meaning the Lord, made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He's saying, when you, when you want to understand how it is that I know who Jesus is, he said, I understand who he is because he, the Lord, may know unto me the mystery. He said, this came to me by revelation. God himself revealed this truth to me. He said, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You see, the Lord opened their understanding. He said, before this, this was not made known. He said, now by the Spirit, he has made it known. He's opened their understanding. Now they understood the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Messiah. Now they understood the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament concerning the Christ. Isaiah 9 and 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. God didn't have a son. God didn't ever have a son. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, and when this term is used, it means these things are identifiers. And his name, his identifiers, shall be called wonderful. I've talked about this in other messages. Meaning, when you look and see what God did, it is awe-inspiring. It inspires wonder. Hallelujah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. Not the Everlasting Son. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Oh my, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 7, Israel decides they want a king. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. God had always been Israel's king. And the judges like Samuel had served as his go-between. He was the voice, uh, they were the voice uh, that spoke on behalf of the Lord to the leadership and the people of Israel. But he was their king. They had no absolute ruler. But suddenly they decided, we want a king like other nations. And 
Samuel goes to the Lord and says, Lord, this thing really bothers me that they're asking for this. And the Lord said, well, don't let it bother you because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Listen to Isaiah 43, 10 through 15. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Again, the term Lord here, coming from the word we commonly uh, attribute Jehovah. He said, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord Jehovah, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Meaning, who's going to prevent me from doing what I set my mind to do? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, even his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, meaning Israel's Redeemer, and the, the, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Who's saying this? Jehovah is saying, I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. And who as I? shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come let them show unto them fear ye not neither be afraid have not I told thee from that time and have declared it ye are even my witnesses is there a God beside me yea there is no God I know not any Jeremiah 46 18 as I live saith the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 35, 3 through 6. These are all passages, my friend, that when the Lord opened the understanding of his apostles and his disciples, these are all the passages that suddenly they got. That they had overlooked, that they had misunderstood, that they had not properly interpreted. But all of a sudden, as the Spirit of God opened their blinded eyes so that they might understand the Scriptures. All of these Old Testament passages came to life. In Isaiah 35, 3 through 6, Strengthen ye the weak hands. And confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. 
even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes on the oh then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped then shall the lame man leap as in heart and the tongue of the dumb sing hallelujah in Luke chapter 7 verses 19 through 22 the apostles had witnessed this but they didn't get it yet. And John calling unto him, John the Baptist, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour, he cured many, Jesus cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind gave he sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, <laughs> Go your way. And tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. He was pointing right back to Isaiah 35. <laughs> he said, your God is coming to save. And when your God comes, these are the things that you're going to see happening. And Jesus, when they asked him, are you he that was to come or do we seek another? He didn't even answer him. He just kept doing what he was doing. He kept healing. He kept delivering. He kept casting out devils. He kept raising the dead. He just kept... Then after a while, they turned around and said you don't eat he said you just go back and tell John what you've seen Hallelujah. John don't get it oh my God have mercy John don't get it my favorite passage probably in the entire word of God Psalm chapter 132 and verse 11 the Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I. Who is I? The Lord hath sworn. Who is the Lord? Jehovah is the Lord. Jehovah declares. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. So Jehovah, God of the Old Testament, made it abundantly clear that at some point in history, he was going to insert himself into the lineage of David. Because he didn't say, I'm going to sit on your throne, David, one day. No, he said, of the fruit of your body. It's going to be a descendant of yours. Mary was the descendant of David, as was the Lord's adopted father, Joseph. But Mary was a descendant. She was also of David's lineage. He said, of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. Oh, when Jesus opened their understanding, Tommy, all of a sudden, the disciples looked at the past three and a half years very differently than they had looked at it before. All of a sudden, they understood things they had never understood. They had a clear revelation from the Holy Ghost exactly what had been going on, why God had to keep this matter kind of shrouded for a while because if the princess were to know, mm -hmm. oh, if princess knew, if the powerful, the influential knew, 
who Jesus was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Oh, my God, have mercy, children. I want to tell you today, I'm closing up pretty quick. In the book of Revelation, here are some things that Jesus has to say. The Word of God declares in Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, this is John, the author of Revelation. He said, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Wait a minute, Jesus. You better be careful. You just committed blasphemy. In Isaiah 44 and verse number 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, even his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Now we have Jesus in Revelation 1 declaring, Fear not. I am the first. I am the last. And just for you, lion cultists who want to try, try to twist things, say, well, this was Jehovah speaking in this sentence. Yes, it sure was. He said, verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. Hallelujah. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Let there be no confusion. The first and the last is Jehovah God of the Old Testament. And the first and the last is the Jesus of the New Testament. They are one. They are the same. They are not joined at the hip. They are the same entity. Hallelujah. My God have mercy. Revelation 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. These things saith the first and the last. And again. I'm telling you, God's wisdom is so far beyond our imagination, it's not even funny. He always words things, make sure you can't twist and pervert it. Trying to make out like, well, somebody else was talking. This wasn't the, this wasn't the glorified Jesus speaking. This was, this was God as a separate person. Really? Because he said, these things say that the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Huh. I think the first and the last has made it abundantly clear he's the same one who went to the cross the same one who went to the grave and the same one who woke up on resurrection Sunday morning hallelujah oh I want to tell you today children Jesus Christ that baby born in the manger was more than a man but more than this, he was more than king of the Jews. See, the wise men came and they, they went to Herod. They said, where is this one born king of the Jews? Scared Herod to death. That's my job. You're telling me that kid's going to take my job? Oh, Herod. If princes knew, they wouldn't have crucified him. He was far more than just the king of the Jews. He was the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. He was the Lord of glory. For had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Oh, but... The king of the Jews, my friend, is not a man born into a position of privilege or power. But rather he is the very God of creation. Who has declared himself to be the first and the last. 
in Isaiah 44 and verse 6. And then again as Jesus declares himself to be the first and the last in both Revelation 1 and 2. Of this you can be certain. Have the princes of this world known in truth who Jesus was? They most certainly would not have crucified him. <laughs> For they would have known him to be the Lord of glory. Lastly, this afternoon, Psalm chapter 24, verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is the king of glory the lord is the lord of hosts he is the king of glory hallelujah to god oh i want to tell you we speak the mystery of god the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Had princes known, <laughs> the story would have been very different. But we would still be in sin. We would still be in need of salvation. Glory to the Lamb of God. Praise the Lord.